Good evening. We're sorry we're starting a few minutes late, but we have a packed house. Tonight, I am honored to welcome Ambassador Ken Taylor and his wife, Dr. Patricia Taylor, as well as my very dear friend, Canadian Senator Pamela Wallen. As you all know, Ken is the former Canadian ambassador to Iran, who together with his wife, Pat, bravely sheltered and helped to engineer the rescue of six Americans during the 1979 hostage crisis. Ken has a long... <laughs> but what you might not know is that Ken and Pat have a very long history with the America Society. Ken was an active, actively served as a director of the board of, on the board of the America Society for many years after joining in 1985. And Pat, as his wife, was also extremely involved with the America Society. And of course, Pamela has been involved with us, arriving as Consul General in Canada and in, from Canada in New York, and has worked closely with the organizations for a, as a senior advisor at different points. I also want to give a very special welcome to Ambassador Guillermo Ryczynski, Permanent Representative of Canada to the United Nations, and of course to our friend John Prato, Consul General of Canada in New York. So. So tonight, it is a true pleasure to have with us three people who have such a connection with the America Society Council of the Americas and who will be speaking about such an important moment in history and an equally important moment in the history in the, of the relationship between the United States and Canada. So, Ken, Pat, Pamela, you can see that there is enormous interest in tonight's program here in New York. I don't think, or there are just a few empty seats in the house, and we have people standing that can sit in those empty seats if they'd like. But we are also being joined by an even larger audience from around the world via our live webcast. So I want to give a very warm welcome to everyone turning in online. And I want to thank our global webcast sponsor, Telefonica. The video will also be available after the program as well. So I invite you all to check out the event page on our website where you can re-watch any part of tonight's discussion or share the link with friends. Now it is my pleasure to pass the microphone to Consul General Prado, who will make a few comments before Pamela begins tonight's conversation. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to the Council of the Americas, America Society. Thank you, Susan, Senator, Ambassador, Pat, Ambassador Rzynski. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I truly feel honored, and in some respects, I feel humbled to be in your presence tonight as we honor not only a great Canadian, but a great man. Tonight, we honor a hero in Ken Taylor, who truly represents the soul of the narrative in this year's Oscar winner, Argo. <laughs> but Ken represents the best in foreign diplomacy and the best in a distinguished line of Canadian diplomats that have served Canada so honorably since Confederation. They are the reasons why a nation of 34 million people, some 1.8 trillion in GDP, is so well respected throughout the world, honored, and has such great influence on the world stage. Je suis très fier de considérer Ken et Pat des bons amis. En fait, ils sont les premiers gens que j'ai rencontrés ici au début de mon séjour à New York. Son conseil est toujours respecté et bien apprécié, particulièrement pour moi, quelqu'un nouveau au monde diplomatique. 
Ken's excellence bridged both the public and private sector. Post his foreign service as Consul General here, he served as Senior Vice President at RJR Nabisco. But Ken will always be known, of course, for his role as Canada's ambassador in Iran. He was there in 1979 when an Islamic revolution toppled the Shah, and when a few months later, in due course, Iranian militants toppled the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, seizing 51 American hostages. As fate would have it, Ken and his team would be able to spirit six Americans out of Tehran on Canadian passports. We measure leadership, and courage, not by our actions in times of normalcy, but by our actions in times of distress, large danger, and great uncertainty. Ken and Pat put the fate of others first, people that were not even their own nationals, and in doing so represented the values that we all in this room treasure, life, liberty, and the security of the person. Some three decades from the time in Iran, and after many subsequent years of public and private service to North America, including to the city that they love, New York City, Ken and Pat continue to resonate. Just ask Oscar. They provide a powerful symbol of the profound relationship that exists between two great nations, Canada and the United States. There have been many who have represented Canada in this great city, a city that I love, including three here tonight. And all of us who have served Canada here in New York are so proud to follow in the footsteps of Ken Taylor. Thank you. My microphone might be on, so I will walk and talk at the same time. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you very much, uh, John. It is indeed an honor. I know when I came here to New York as Consul General, I ended up on an annual basis going to uh, a half a dozen or a dozen events celebrating Ken Taylor. Uh, the memory of his actions uh, remained very firm, very large in people's memories. and. Uh, it was nice for us to be able to celebrate that and to, to um, live in your reflected glory, I think, in that sense. <laughs> Thank God the Oscars have now uh, allowed us uh, to look at this issue again. When we decided to do this, I was talking with Susan and we said, any which way it goes on Oscar night, this will be good. Um, but uh, for Argo to, uh, to win the best uh, picture, I think, says a lot about how we care about these issues. But I do want to preface our remarks tonight by saying, please remember that Argo is a movie. <laughs> and tonight, what we're going to do is talk a little history. And I think uh, that those stories um, might be a little different. It's hard to imagine uh, this. Uh, you'll, you'll hear the phrases, the Canadian caper it's referred to, our man in Tehran. Uh, this is part of our culture. It's hard to imagine, Ken and Pat, you got there at that time in history. Iran was not a trouble spot. It was actually an exotic spot to go to. Uh, and you arrived without any concern for that. Set the stage a little for us. Well, uh, first, I, when I was growing up in Calgary, I intended to have nothing to do officially with Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> However, my ambitions were somewhat more limited and modest. Uh, but again, Pamela, setting the stage in Tehran, it was a a country that had aspirations. It had some similarities with Canada, a border with a superpower, right. Soviet Union, the US, one more amenable and friendly than the other. <laughs> the Shah reflected, I think, he sensed a, a similarity between the two countries. He um, had a visit with um, Prime Minister Trudeau and um, that went very well. It was a country that seemed to have a, a certain stability with it, with the, the, the a big army, a growing middle class. Um, however, even at that stage in 1977, there was a 
somewhat of a degree of uneasiness. But looking back and thinking of conversations with journalists, Iranian themselves, I can't recall anyone who said, 1979, 1980, everything is going to change. Yeah. But um, I arrived again as a, as, a, as a diplomat, John, Gill, and what have you. you. When you arrive at a new post, you have great expectations. Um, your life is going to change. It's going to be glamorous, what have you. <laughs> Whether or not there's a revolutionary that comes up in the end is, is a foregone conclusion. But Pat again um, arrived in Tehran with, a, with a, a different mandate, that a different challenge than I did as a scientist. Well, Iran at that time was really on the brink of discovering all sorts of things. I worked at the Iranian Blood Transfusion Service and the Pasteur Institute, and they were really anxious for foreign input, for new ideas from different countries. In fact, at the uh, Blood Transfusion Service, at least a third of the investigators there were foreign. But by the time we left, I was the only one. So it went through these stages. And then also, most of my colleagues had had a, a lot of experience in different countries. Many of them had come to the United States. Some of them had spent time in England and Europe. Mm -hmm. And they were really anxious to proceed and to uh, put their country in the forefront of scientific research. And you were also a uh, mother of the two yeah. of you parents. <laughs> Douglas was there. Yes, our son Douglas came with us. And he, he went to the French Lycée. It's a wonderful system if you're in the diplomatic service because children just continue. And it doesn't matter which country you're in, um, they can sort of just take off, take up where they left off. So he was fine, and he uh, enjoyed school, went there. And then the revolution started, or at least the trouble started, and the school closed. And after about two months, Douglas said, well, you know, Mum, although he, previously he didn't take much to schooling, but he did come to me and say, I really have to go to school somewhere because this sitting at home. <laughs> So they, as much they, as we love mum and dad, enough, yeah, 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 enough already. Right. Well, it, it is hard to cast our minds back, and, and I think the movie helped us do that to a certain extent. Revolution breaks out. Uh, this small group escapes from the American embassy. There is no, nobody's got a Blackberry or an iPhone. Uh, there's no Google. There's no uh, Google search to find a map. There's no instant communication. So all of this actually had to happen, Ken, on the ground in real time, in many cases with face-to-face -face communication. When did you first sense all of this? Well, I, um, if I can, no, no, um, I don't mean to criticize the new communications era or Google <laughs> or anybody else, but I think if we would have had the branch, the reach of communication we have now, I'd still be in Tehran. <laughs> I mean, picture Possibly this. As a hostage. Picture yeah. this: this unique situation. Your ba your boss can't contact you. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a, a, a worker's dream. <laughs> On the other hand, you can't contact your boss. Yeah. That's right. It's a worker's dream. Seek forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> Rule number one. Yeah. But not to be too um, facetious. We had, of course, a, um, um, a cipher communication system. Um, not something that you could hold in your hand. It was more like a ping pong table. <laughs> um, we had some gifted technicians. Heaven help if I had to run the machine. And um, that's how we communicated. So um, although we would have welcomed um, some, uh, what would you say, advice or what have you from Ottawa, which we did get from my colleagues almost daily written out, but there was no telephone calls. There was no a message is waiting. Um, so it was a mixed blessing, Pamela. The, the, the whatever transpired in the end um, was really an Ottawa responsibility as well as Tehran. Um, the, the backup in Ottawa was remarkable. And as you mentioned earlier, the link between Washington and, and um, Ottawa is an easy and open one. Um, you see that every day. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly at the United Nations, that's reflected. Um, reflected there. 
So, um, but we, we started afresh. We had the, the total support of the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Clark and Foreign Minister Flora MacDonald. The political consequences, if it would have gone wrong, would have gone back to the Prime Minister and I think the comment would have been, how on earth did you authorize that crazy scheme? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think really the, 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 the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, or my colleagues in, in, in Ottawa, who didn't have the memory, the, the blare of the spotlight at the moment, were absolutely instrumental in, um, in getting us home. One of the headlines, and you have to um, understand in Canada, uh, we, the relationship is with the United States is powerful and important and our, and our most uh, crucial ally. But we also have a little bit of a tug and pull. We want America <laughs> to love us, but not too much. <laughs> and uh, we want you to pay attention, but not too much. Don't tell us what to do. It's kind of a, uh, a crazy relationship. And when uh, one of the books was written about this Canadian caper, and I'm going to come back to the details in a moment, but the headlines in the Canadian newspapers um, were the following. Our man in Tehran, a spy for America. Uh, and some people thought that's okay, and other people <laughs> went, oh my God. Um, walk us through that, Ken. Were you a spy for America? Well, <laughs> my, my sort of self-image is more of Austin Powers rather than <laughs> James Bond. <laughs> I regret I don't have the glasses to prove it, which I, I used to have. Um, an exchange of intelligence is, is a is a rather contentious issue, as you suggest, yeah. Pam. The, the, um, uh, there's the, of course, the, uh, my colleagues in the embassy, myself, and um, hearing Pat's um, rendition from all the Iranians, she meant we'd send back reports, of course, as to how we read the situation, as to how my diplomatic colleagues are addressing the, um, what would you say, the um, 52, other than the six. Right. But um, about two months in, uh, the U.S., the United States, I think, had, had decided that a commando raid, that is a surgical raid, rather than a total, what would you say, declaration of war with Iran. That is, um, you've got 48 hours or your oil refineries are going to be prehistoric ruins. Right. Um, something of that nature, they decide, well, maybe if we can send in 50 special forces surreptitiously with stealth, um, get them downtown, raid the compound, retrieve the 52, go and get the three who are at the foreign ministry, make it out and take off by helicopter, would release and relieve the pressure that the, uh, the administration was feeling from the U.S. population. Uh, uh, not being necessarily in the U.S., but by the newscasts we occasionally would get, there was a tremendous sense of frustration, of, of bewilderment about what did the United States do to Iran to deserve this? Mm -hmm. Or here we are, the most powerful country in the world, and we don't seem to be able to respond in a tangible way. And so the, the thought was this would be one solution, not, a, a, not a, maybe a comprehensive one. Uh, the United States had no uh, um, CIA or Pentagon officers remaining in Tehran. Um, Prime Minister Clark received a call from President Carter um, saying, would we be prepared to provide intelligence to the United States in anticipation? Um, one officer who was with me, Sergeant Jim Edwards, a military police officer with the Canadian military who was there on crowd control primarily, and then one CIA officer who was attached to our embassy. Um, his name was Bob. And that's as far as I got. So, but he was a marvelous guy, resourceful and what have you. So between the two of them, they would spend eight or nine hours a day monitoring the activity of the compound in anticipation of a commando raid. Um, one article, again, other than Austin Powers, that uh, had a little note and a picture of myself, it said, an accidental spy. So when you ask for a, di a definition of a spy, I think it was all by accident, <laughs> quite actually. You notice and how <laughs> he's nicely evaded this <laughs> <laughs> of course. So. 
We don't but, want you going to jail at this late date. But, um, <laughs> and then um, what we were doing apart from the six, apart from the normal diplomatic aspect was a, a, a rather quiet operation. Um, sometimes Pat would say, well, you look rather preoccupied. I say, no, I'm just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a great quote that I want to use that an ambassador, and some of you will appreciate mm -hmm. this, an ambassador is an honest man who lies abroad for the good of his country. <laughs> um, and I think it was for the good of both of our countries, so I appreciate that. You two ended up with uh, this group of the six um, in your two. home. Yeah. If you're to watch the movie, it looks very much like um, you're the doorman. And that you let them in, poured some wine, uh, gave them a few meals. And this is, I think, one of the points of contention that Canadians have Canadians all riled up, uh, is that the CIA man on the ground was actually there for a day and a half, uh, the Ben Affleck character. Um, but that you were there uh, for a very long time with these people, high risk to yourselves at any moment. Um, the revolutionaries, the authorities, whatever definition of authority you have, could have come in with guns a-blazing and you would have been mm -hmm. gone as well. Well, I, th I think um, you sum it up, Pamela, but um, I will say that, um, at least in the movie, I hope you appreciate with what skill I turned the door and opened it. Yes. That is, uh, <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> that was... Um, <laughs> That is not an easy, easy task <laughs> under the pressure that we're there. But um, Pat really was the, um, we had, um, um, unlike the, the movie which had six with us, for reasons that Hollywood have of their own, um, two were with us and four were with right. John Sheardown and Zena, my colleague. And really Pat was the first one who saw the two, Joe and Kathy Stafford, who stayed with us. And then it was incumbent upon um, Pat to explain the unexpected arrival of some Canadian tourists. What did you say to the staff and to others around you? Because you had Iranians working for you. That was risky. You didn't know what political side of the coin they were on. Those Iranians, four or five of them, that, whom we had as servants, had worked for previous um, right. Canadian diplomats. They, so they were very loyal. But they were curious because mm -hmm. The one of them, one of the servers, came to me one day and said, Madam, you told us they were interested in seeing our country, but they never go out. <laughs> so it was a matter of looking him in the eye and telling him, well, they've been traveling quite a lot, so they're tired, they need to rest. And then another one came to me and said, you know, it's curious, they've been here for two months, but they only arrived with a little suitcase a little suitcase, like a right. school case. And uh, they have, no, and the other thing is, they I found <laughs> some of your clothes in their hamper. So yeah. you look them in the eye again and you say, you know, they like to travel lightly. So they believe that. And I, I think they believed that they, they had their own curiosity. But they were so loyal that when the Revolutionary Guards questioned them mm -hmm. after we had left, they could uh, say with all honesty that they didn't know anything about what But was you done. think, of course, they did know. They didn't know outright, but you know, you have to be a little curious when people stay with you for such a long time mm -hmm. and don't go out. Did Only go out <laughs> when they're allowed. <laughs> did you actually feel fear? Did you know the enormity and the risk attached to what you were doing? Oh, I, I knew the risk, but you know, you can't really f feel fear, or at least you can't show it. You might internalize it, but on the, because I was working mm -hmm. with Iranians, with Persians, uh, every day, and I would call home just to see if they were okay. And um, so I think you internalize it more than you show it. And this was sort of heightened by the fact that on the last night that I was there, I had told my colleagues that I was leaving, and some of them were just curious about different experiments of how can you tell in experimental animals when something happens. So I ran down the corridor to get some reprints and some notes and slipped. And they called the doctor when he came, 
my blood pressure had s sort of soared to unbelievable height, and he wanted to put me into hospital straight away. But I was leaving the next day, so right. I said, perhaps on Monday I would do it if I was <laughs> But you also had your own experiences there where uh, the, the revolutionaries were coming in. You ran the blood, the equivalent of the blood services. I didn't run it, but well, I was a... <laughs> Um, yes, yes, she did, but that was not the title. <laughs> okay. Because they, um, the revolutionaries would gather just a couple of blocks. The University of Tehran was just a few blocks away right. from the blood transfusion service, and they would often run through uh, our building. We would, first of all, have, uh, say, military that was uh, loyal to the Shah, so they would grab all the white coats that were available and and pretend to be uh, uh, scientists, and then they would hear the revolutionaries, so they'd go out and the revolutionaries would come in and say, where are they, where are they? And then they'd start shooting up in the air, not wanting to hurt anyone, mm -hmm. but they forgot that the research labs were in the air. So I thank my lucky stars that I had studied ballet and was able to tap them <laughs> when the <laughs> bullets came up. Can your day, um, there, you had to appear to go to the office from time to time. Other allied ambassadors were there, the British and, mm -hmm. and others. You had communication with them. They knew. It's, a, it's on one level amazing that this did not leak out, that the, the secret was not uh, um, blown. On the other hand, you had to go through such hoops to communicate with people, to go drive over to another embassy and say, this is what's happening, do you have any spare food, we need this, clothes, whatever it may be, and try and keep up the pretense of working. Yeah, it's sort of like when I was Consul General in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was more John than a Warnker. pretense of working, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I'm telling you as a consul general that came here, if you want a good restaurant, you just go in and say Ambassador Taylor sent me. <laughs> okay, sorry, go on. <laughs> the, um, the diplomatic corps, and, and um, as um, you're all um, aware, there's, a, there's uh, of course, uh, maybe depending on the importance of the country. But when I first arrived in Tehran, there were 90 embassies, a few. And of course, the, the propelling, the compelling aspect was the oil and gas and petroleum right. and um, the Shah's ambitions in, in the Middle East. And so it was, a, and it was a, a, a lot of embassies. By the time I left, it was maybe um, 30 were left or 25. Uh, the interest went down during the revolution. <laughs> and, uh, but of that group that remained, we met frequently and often among ourselves. Say the, the European Union diplomats met, the South American diplomats, the Middle East, what have you. But some of us found ourselves, um, what sort of group do we belong to? Mm -hmm. And um, so it was usually this odd conglomeration of Spain, Portugal, Australia, New Zealand, Australia, um, Finland, and that was one group, and um, then we then interact among ourselves. But of the diplomats who were there, I think it's, I'm not sure whether anybody is here from New Zealand or Denmark, um, but the two ambassadors from those countries, I think, are a good example of what diplomats do abroad in a general sense, not only for their own country. Um, the two ambassadors were, um, gave remarkable assistance to those of us um, in the Canadian Embassy. And it was at a risk and a cost to themselves, potentially, because New Zealand had a huge market for lamb in Tehran, and Denmark had a huge market for dairy products. And I think their capital cities, maybe they were not as prone to support their, their ambassadors' help to us, but they did it whether they're Copenhagen or New Zealand knew it. And I think one example of a, of a, of a classic case of the New Zealand ambassador, for instance, um, Jean Peltier, you may remember from La Presse, pretty much had the story two months in. Um, discussions were held by the, with the publisher of La Presse, um, with Ottawa, with Washington, and the La Presse said they would not publish the story 
until the, Canadi the Canadians had seen the U.S. diplomats back. Uh, however, Might not happen today. Yeah, yeah. This is the, another point, yeah. Pamela. Being in the media, you'll, you'll recognize. I, I've, again, addressing maybe the earlier point on the social media, on the today's means of communication, I think there's, a, there's a, certainly a fair amount of, of truth to that. But in anticipation maybe of the, of the story breaking, um, I went to the New Zealand ambassador and said, here's $25,000. Go on, would you mind renting a villa down the street? And he said, sure. And the villas at that time in Tehran, the walls were 12 feet high and what have you. So what we had in mind is if the story broke and it would take 20 minutes or some time for the Iranians to find out, read the whatever newspaper they're yes, reading the or whatever, cranked up over the copyright, we could move the U.S. diplomats into the villa down the street. And so Chris Beebe, the master in Thames, went down the street. The Iranian landlord was, of course, just euphoric. He'd had this villa empty. <laughs> the idea of renting it during a revolution never even occurred to him. <laughs> and here he's being paid in cash. <laughs> He said, are you sure you don't want it for a year? Because <laughs> <laughs> Stevie said no. As it worked out, we did not have to use it. But um, that was a, a variable, Pam, as you suggest, that um, the whole matter of whether or not it was going to be kept a secret, whether right. or not it became a um, variable. I, I um, though would like to say that as I go on, there was a, a, a lot of interplay between Washington and Ottawa. Tony Mendez himself, who I worked um, I enjoyed working with Tony. He uh, was a, 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 a well, ingenious and um, brave individual. Um, but when I talk about the Canadians, it really was a, 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 a contribution at the end that the CIA right. made and um, was certainly of, of importance, but not particularly crucial. Let's separate this f fact from fiction because people ask me, and I know they ask you, uh, and how much of the movie is true? And I don't know how many of you have seen it, but there are uh, also you know, bits and pieces where they're being chased down the runway at the end mm -hmm. with the Americans on the plane, and you're mm -hmm. escaping on a train the other day, yeah. the, you know, the, the next morning, all of these things. Like, uh, and I know you, can, Ben Affleck, consulted mm -hmm. with you, um, sort of. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so tell us a little, I mean, for, for people who've seen the movie, um, what, what well, should they I, take I, away? I, I sort of in, enjoyed it. I was almost <laughs> sitting looking at this screen with Pat and saying, gee, I wish I would have been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... Um, Pat sort of nudged me halfway through the movie and said, do we get out okay? <laughs> <laughs> Did you? <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, the movie, it, it, and um, I was wondering if the same thought occurred to many of you. If you look at see three of the movies, the, the um, Lincoln, Zero Dark Thirty, Thirty. and... Um, Argo is each one of them where some uh, the press contested yep. the issue of the veracity of Hollywood and whether or not a movie's for entertainment, whether or not a movie's for the historical record, or where does a movie sit? Right. And um, uh, each one of you, I imagine, would have a different idea. But Pat, you have your thoughts on that. Well, I, th I think movies are great as far as entertainment is concerned, but if they try to distort a story so much. Right that much of the truth is left out. And what I worry about when I see movies of that sort is what the younger generation right. will believe. Because they may not have been alive when the actual event took place, and this is all they've seen. And unfortunately, Oliver Stone not on Kennedy, everyone yes. will. Yeah. Yeah. And so they take it for the truth. Right. And uh, well, a lot of that movie, of course, was not true. We didn't leave by train and we didn't leave together, and I don't know, I, 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 even today, up until today, I've never seen 
Ken with a worried look on his face. <laughs> <laughs> I practiced. <laughs> Your character <laughs> practiced. <laughs> well, th I mean, you've raised an interesting point. I don't want to go too far off topic here, but I mean, there is some, you know, especially with the Zero Dark Thirty, the controversy that's there is there's mm. some attempt to kind of uh, make sure that, that Americans in particular feel better about the role of the mm. CIA and mm. what they do and, and that in Argo they really did ride in on the white mm. horse to the rescue and therefore it's a good news story. Uh, as you say, they were there the last day and a half. The guy was genius. No one mm. takes that away from yeah. him. Uh, but that's just not how it mm. unfolded. No. And I, I think that um, looking back over since the, since the um, opening in, in Toronto, and uh, then the, the the response in in um, in Canada, the back and forth, some editing at the end of the movie, uh, that there was a there's a, a genuine response certainly to Canada when we first came back, and that endures. Um, U.S. citizens are are genuinely open, and um, U.S. citizens have long memories yes, about what happens. Um, in the past, and, and, and very, very are. generous in extending that that will. But uh, what was a, a, a bit of a, a, a explosive, if I could say, development was when Pierce Morgan, of course, Morgan was interviewing President Carter right. last yeah. week. Um, I think um, Pierce thought that all of a sudden the president had gone off script <laughs> <laughs> by giving so much <laughs> credit. <laughs> but. Yeah. He was, he'd already, he'd already, he, um, President Carter and his wife Rosalind had received an honorary degree at Queen's University in the fall. And he essentially said that, but that was to a restricted audience. Yeah. Um, CNN is another uh, matter, particularly yeah. the, the interview show. So his declaration that um, that's the way he recollects it. Um, sort of added, I, I mentioned that it just wasn't a Canadian talking about what Canadians right. did. Right. Uh, it was a cross the border, his interpretation. And uh, I think certainly the, the um, response in Ottawa or in Canada in, in, in general was, um, well, we're delighted that we were able to work with the United States. Mm -hmm. And then we're very pleased that the president declared that we were a, a, a player. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the thing because you don't want to as a country, it's not about you and Pat or Canada saying, uh, you know, look at us, we were more important. Uh, I think it goes more to your point, Pat, which is, is this the telling of history or is it just a movie and then do we have to make that distinction? Because this is important for people to understand what happened rather than, and, and Ken, just let me say, when he went to see the opening of this movie, the Toronto Film Festival, and uh, sat there at the end, I think he sort of called Ben Affleck at that point. Would that be fair to say? No, I, I was in, um, um, I was in New York. Oh, you were in New York, yeah. okay. Yeah, I was um, watching it spiritually. Okay, spiritually. <laughs> but he no. did say, and, no. and you see now a crawl at the end of the movie that says, we would like to thank the Canadian yep. government. And that's mm -hmm. an important thing because Ken did not say, could you please put my name and my wife Pat's name up there. They mm -hmm. said, could you thank the Canadian government because yeah, it very much was what went on well, it, it, back in Ottawa um, It well. was, um, as you, yeah, the, the, um, we were not, a, we didn't attend the opening in Toronto. Oh, okay. Um, it was here, yeah. But, um, you assume we were there. Yeah. <laughs> a, 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 As the stories went in the <laughs> Canadian <laughs> press, you were. Yeah. <laughs> some friends or some Canadians um, commented early on in the movie that it really wasn't a, a fair patrol, patrol, uh, portrayal. And um, this then McLean's wrote an article, the Toronto Star, the generally of the Canadian press, and um, so on. I think that this was Friday, on Tuesday. Um, the phone rings, and I pick it up, and it's Ben. <laughs> Thinking, I don't know Ben. <laughs> oh, I said, no, yes. How are things in that Hollywood? Ben. <laughs> he said, well, I understand you have some issues. Can they have some issues? I said, yeah, yeah, we've got some issues. Well, why don't we work this out? I said, yes, we're two mature people, at least trying to be. Um, We'll get together. So he proposed, Pat and I came out um, 
to the um, Los Angeles and see the movie and talk and meet and what have you. At that time, there was an objectable, there was a, 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 a paragraph at the end. The movie went on to suggest this, but I'm not in declarative statements, that um, really the Canadians had essentially received undue credit for what had happened. And that now the story is broken, finally, it kept, the true story can be told that it was a totally a CIA operation. Um, that was that, aggravating to that Canadians. That line remains yeah. in the movie. Yeah, in the movie. It but says, it says yeah, the yeah. Canadian, I suppose we'll yeah. let to, have well, to I let the Canadians. I suppose we'll let the Canadians yeah. take the credit. Yeah. But um, the movie was made. Um, however, the caption's there, and I said, you yeah. know, that's just not acceptable. Um, so, and said, well, okay, it'll cost money, but I'll take it out. And then what do you want in? What do we put in? I said, well, we sort of, he said, well, why don't you write it then? And it was something along the lines that, um, um, Pamela suggested. So that at least gave the closing caption um, some authenticity. Um, the movie, though, still suggests, but, um, you know, Canadians, we can, we can live with a lot of things. <laughs> a, a humble, <laughs> kind, friendly lot. Just too cold to fight. But I do yeah. want to say before we close... We're going to take some questions, so don't oh, worry. Oh, all right. That um, Iranians are not the fanatics that are portrayed right. in the movie, and they're not fanatic as we think of them, because without their help, I, I would have had a lot of difficulty. I mean, there was one time, I think, there, uh, um, the, the demonstrations had mm -hmm. become very uh, difficult, and so all of my colleagues decided that I would they would drive me home, so someone was designated as a driver, and he drove me home from the blood center to our residence, but he had a photograph that had the Shah on one side and Khomeini on the other, and he had a radio with different uh, stations, one which played religious music, right. another which played um, rock and roll. Depending on who was in the yes, car. That's right, depending on which part of the uh, area we were in. Right. So it took us a long time to get home. It, we were having a because dinner of the road, party. Yeah. It, it, the roadblocks. The roadblocks yeah. at yeah. each of the So corners. Pat and the driver would try to uh, assess whether this, these troops at the roadblock were pro or anti Khomeini or Shah, and then Flip the reverse the picture. That's right. mm -hmm. um, I think you Amazing. did it okay half the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a, couple, a question here. Are you waiting? Is there someone? I, I, I want to get a few in. We started a bit late, so I'm sorry we've, we've gone on here. But uh, where are the microphones? There's one there, and is there micro and one right back there. So if you have any questions, just please uh, put up your hand. And there, is there one here? Yes, go ahead. We'll start over there. Thank you. I was going to ask you, knowing what you know now, could you have seen what was coming to Iran then? No, I, I, no. I really missed it. I think I, I thought that one way or the other, the, um, the Shah would change around, maybe give the, the parliament a, a bit more influence, maybe um, bring in some other members of his family, maybe take some other members of his family out of business. Um, generally speaking, and then with a 700,000 in the army, the military, that he could sustain it. Um, so my guess was that probably he'd stumble along. It wasn't going to be the same. Um, but however, it was, um, and that was sort of in a, in a sense, uh, it, maybe it helps alleviate the naivety is when I, um, after Khomeini arrived, I spent some time with his advisors who were with him in Paris. And uh, I s sort of remarked, well, I guess it's taking a while to get yeah. used to forming a government, uh, rather unorthodox government. And um, these were um, a couple of them that got their PhDs in the US, but they were totally dedicated to Khomeini's right. and future, what have you. They said, well, what did we know? We thought we'd be in Paris for five years. 
Yeah. We never thought the Shah's yeah. government would, would collapse in that relatively short time. We were looking to the long plan. So he said, what happens? We get to Paris and almost a year later we're, we're landing in Tehran. Right. So we're scrambling. But it was, so they I think were too. They were, they were surprised There's a too. question here? Just right around the, uh, the corner. Oh, you've got a microphone? No? Okay. Thank you for all that you've done. Um, I have two uh, questions. One, uh, have you, were any of your staff, your Iranian staff, uh, harmed after you left? Um, and secondly, uh, you mentioned something here about not really understanding at that moment what was happening. Are there lessons learned uh, from this uh, regarding, for example, our problem in Benghazi, where we want to convince ourselves that things are going to be a certain way and they're not always that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, um, some of the staff were interrogated after we left, but I, I think in a, not in a, in, a, in a violent or a malicious way, but they, they, they were questioned. Um, but to the extent that they kept on working at, the, at our embassy when the Danish chargé d'affaires came in to live in our residence. So there was an a, a uncomfortable short time, I think, for them, but it was worked out okay. Um, if there's any lessons to be drawn from um, this, um, I think the one aspect is, is that here 32 years later, it's, it's similar things are happening. Uh, the Benghazi case is a particularly tragic one. Um, but again, I think some of the questions that are going on in Washington with respect to the Senate are legitimate questions but miss the point. Um, the point being that unless you have a host government that's prepared or able to reinforce your own internal security, it may be a long night. Uh, there's only so much uh, uh, the, the Marines can do, particularly when they're under orders not to shoot. Uh, so the inevitability is, is tough um, in a country where you have a formative government or in, um, in well, Libya is the one, um, the one case, or if you think of, of Egypt at the moment, um, it's, not a, it's a pretty precarious situation to be in the U.S. Embassy at the moment, although you do have a, have a, have a, have a military there that's, that's distinct yes. from, from say even Tunisia, it's distinct from um, Libya. And uh, Syria, of course, there's, I don't know if there's really any formal embassy presence left. That d just raises a question on that point because uh, Canada shut down its presence in uh, mm -hmm. Iran and you were critical of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I think unless there was a, um, a reason that um, Ottawa's decided not to disclose, uh, I found the, the press release and the, and the rationale behind it um, um, not necessarily persuasive or convincing. Uh, not um, in, in terms of access, there's not much to the government, but if you look at Washington, if you take, um, why are the lights on late at night in Tel Aviv or Berlin or Tokyo? It's because of the Iranian situation. Certainly Syria is a preoccupation yeah. at the moment. Is there, certainly North Korea is. You, you've got trouble spots, you can, everyone here can pin out one, but, but at the same time the enduring issue at the moment is Tehran. Now, that's where you should be. Um, on the ground. On the ground, yeah. Okay, there was a question back there, I know, for, yes, I think somewhere, have you got the mic there? Sorry? Oh, it's here? Oh, it's here. Sorry, uh, thank you. Go Salam, ahead. Mr. Ambassador. I'm one of the, I guess, few Iranians that are here. Um, I wasn't going to see Argo if it wasn't because of you. And uh, it was painful to watch the movie because the movie started out with totally distorting history of Iran. It started out, and um, I would like to quote Dr. Mossadegh, the Prime Minister of Iran that was taken down by CIA, and he said, if I sit silently, I have sinned. And I would like to say that Iran, before the revolution, it was the, the, it, the regime was pretty much like England. We had monarchy, and we had parliament, and we had a prime minister. So they started by saying that CIA took down the Prime Minister Mossadegh, but then the whole monarchy, which was 2,500 years, it was a display of ignorance that in less than a minute they wrapped it up by the Shah's wife taking bath in the milk 
and French food being sent to Iran in the Concord. And the Shah had chefs, and we had pretty decent food, as you mentioned, imported from all over the world. And it was painful to watch this. And then we moved on to the revolution, which certain scenery was accurate. But again, Persians were shown as ignorant, unshaven maniacs that that's Pat sort of mentioned it. Mm -hmm. And I really yeah. appreciate it, that you supported the Iranians. I don't know many revolutions that people, right. revolutions are not dinner reservation, that Let's people dress up in Chanel. Comment. But if you would speak like about like um, Iran a little bit, your experience of the Iranian people and your interactions with the I Iranians. Think we started and off with that. I think that's and the Oscar, how you felt about Mrs. Obama personally <laughs> presenting the Oscars. This is a new thing for me. I thought this was supposed to be arts are supposed to be neutral. Olympics are supposed to be neutral. How you felt okay, about we'll that? Okay, we'll get some comments from them. Thanks. Well, go ahead. Mm -hmm. For me, the, uh, my colleagues, as I said, were all Iranian, all yeah. Persian. And um, on the last, I hadn't been paid for six months <laughs> in either, anywhere that yes. I was working. But when I did tell the directors of both those institutions that I was leaving, they hurried and got me back pay in a check hmm. and handed to me. Uh, one of those checks I couldn't cash because the banks were closed. Right. But all of my colleagues who were in the locker room on that evening got together and all got out their purses and worked out how much money they had. And they gave me as wow. much Iranian cash as they could for my check. And I don't know whether in the end they were able to cash that check or not. Right. And then also, there was once when I received a threatening letter at work. and. Um, I told the director, and he immediately told my colleagues, and they were all running around the blood transfusion service trying to locate or trying to see if the letter might have been written internally. Mm -hmm. And they discovered it was, and they even discovered the typewriter on which it was written. And uh, one of them came to me, the assistant director, and said, don't worry, this woman who owns this typewriter is very disgruntled. We've had trouble with her before. And uh, nothing, she threatened to blow up the blood center and to harm Douglas and Ken. And so I got a little worried. Mm -hmm. Nothing did happen. They right. all were very protective of me and took me home each night. And um, Ken sent the letter, or copy of the letter, of course, to Ottawa. And they said, you have to leave straight away, which I did. But I went back. No, you, you, you know, Pat left for two days. I said, did you leave? Or did you tell them? Oh, and then she went back to work. Yes. All right, I know there was, uh, OK, where is the microphone? And, and I'm trying to get back in the room there, too. And there's one over here. So do I need to and stand up? And try and keep our questions short, and we can get Do I need to more. stand up because of this? No, just go ahead. Just OK. Get um, maybe because I grew up as an oil company brat living overseas, but my relationship and connection to um, what I like to call Persia Iran goes back to the 70s when a certain um, ambassador from Iran to Venezuela was a, was a family friend to, to going to University of Massachusetts when one of my housemates or roommates was from Persia uh, living in England, couldn't go home because of what was happening there because they were guaranteeing her back in school to going to graduate school in England that educated a number of people from, from Iran. My question to you is, is in watching what I have watched because of my connections, where do you see Iran going in one year, five years, 10 years, in relationship to the rest of the world, let alone in relationship to the other Middle East countries? That's it. Get out your crystal ball. <laughs> well, I, I, um, I, I think to some extent the, the, the revolution is still going on. It's, a, it's an experiment. Going on. Here, here you have a, a, a quasi-democracy with the theological state. And the world doesn't know really whether that's workable. Um, you have a supreme leader who is not elected, but yet is the supreme leader. You have a parliament that is elected, but at the same time only select people can run for office. So I think you can say it's in an early stage 
I, I think the Iranians want some justice. I think particularly young Iranians want a, a, a country to take pride in, where they have some dignity, what have you. So I think that um, it's a lot to expect. And maybe in terms of Iranian history, 3,000 years, 34 years isn't much. But are we right to be scared to death of them having well, nuclear? Well, I, th I think the, the um, now, the aspect of the, the bomb is, is not something which the Ayatollah started. The Shah had ambitions, um, peaceful for that, but yet at the same time, introducing Iran into the modern age, their historic pride, but let's enter the 20th, 20th and 21st century. When the revolution, when Khomeini came, they suspended the program. But then people thought, well, maybe this is something we want to perpetuate. So now you have a, a, a sense, I think, of, of Iran feeling that they have a right to say that they're going to uh, develop it for peaceful purposes. The world is skeptical. Um, and then when you're looking at, um, I think for the first time since since maybe, remember Dr. Strangelove, remember on the beach, um, remember the, that time when children were under their school desks. I think you're going to come into a situation now where with North Korea and where with Iran not necessarily having a bomb nor stating that they do not want a bomb, that you're going to have another concern not panic, but a realization that this is precarious times, which um, oftentimes brings it back to a, a dilemma, and it's your own choice. Um, would you prefer to let Iran have that capability and see how it works out, or would you decide to try to th three through a raid a serious bombing commitment, what have you, to destroy their capacity, at least in the short term. Um, which would be worse? And um, I, I, I think there has to be a level of thinking, well, and this is some, it's beginning to permeate Washington, but not persuasively, I'd say that, that what, um, what about, there are now nine countries with that capability. What about if Iran had that capability? Or do we want to, if in it comes close to that, or do we want to, my own sort of sense is that a raid would be catastrophic. We have just a couple of minutes, and I know there's, where is the microphone back there, sorry? Just if you can grab one there, and we have a lady here. I'm gonna ask you to put your question, put your question, and then we'll, uh, we'll get answers, because we're trying to wrap it up. Have you, uh, who's got the microphone? Sorry, go ahead. Ambassador, uh, after you, we left where you and your wife uh, were able to, to leave Tehran. At some point, uh, your participation in the events became public knowledge. Uh, what have you heard or since then from official sources uh, in the Iranian government, uh, their reactions? Have you had interactions with, Iranian, with Iranians government officials or diplomats in the years since who've referred to your role in these events? Okay, we'll get to that and then we just, if you just pose your question sure. and then we'll, yeah. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, you're in the unique position to have been a diplomat in Iran, uh, both pre, uh, prior to the revolution and after the revolution. And you spent time with, with both types of governments and you know the Iranian people. If there was one insight you could give the current um, administration, U.S. administration, to break the impasse that um, currently exists, what would that be? Well, I, um, and then just work in yeah, this well, other, this, yes. This was, just um, the, yeah, did you I'll have any I'll ongoing any on connection? Um, no, I have not um, had any sort of give or take, formal or otherwise, with Iranian officials. Um, it, as um, we're all aware that um, uh, certainly New York, Houston, Los Angeles, Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto have become a, a, a popular, a good destination for Iranians. And, um, and uh, I think, um, speaking generally, there's been a very successful um, landing for them. And but we're waiting for the movie, the Iranian movie. They're <laughs> yeah. doing their own version of Argo, by the way. So 
Yeah. Uh, we'll come back when that happens, yeah. And um, I was thinking of contacting the producer to see if they do want me to play a real life role <laughs> or not. <laughs> but I haven't been invited. But your question is a, is a good one. No, I have not, but I've, I've kept in track to the stage possible, as Pat has with her, her medical okay. friends, as to what's going on, but it's, it's, um, it is difficult. And, and do you have a, a bit of advice, whether it's yeah, yeah. Well, that the it's First Lady should not hand out the Oscars, or that they should be... Uh, <laughs> Well, I was quite mesmerized when she <laughs> handed it out quite dry. And, uh, whether or not that, that's a, a, a presidential first lady to do it, what have you, I don't have any strong views. I found it um, entertaining. But, um, now, it, with respect to um, the Rani, and I, th I think that to a lot of us is, and maybe foreign policy isn't formed this way, but there's a lot of self-rationalization of what you'd like the country to be what you'd like the conclusion to be. And I think to a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the Canadians, the West and what have you, thought that during the Iranian Revolution, this is what we'd like to see the conclusion as. And then it's remarkable how you can come to that conclusion to support your own, own views. So one aspect would be um, don't assume what you'd like the conclusion to, um, to be. The other, I think, is that the Iranians have made it very clear um, that um, they are not prepared to seriously negotiate with an overhanging threat. Now, on the other side of the table, you can say the, the five plus one, that is the Security Council plus Germany are saying, yes, but if we don't threat, we don't place a threat, is there going to be any movement forward in diplomacy or is it just b bidding time to thing? So I think that um, in the back of that is the Iranians, I think for for centuries are looking, um, sure there's expediency and self-interest, but on the other hand, Iranians feel that after 3,000 years, they should be able to save face in this. They're not going to be, they said, we wouldn't have had a revolution if we're going to be again sub submitted to over these last centuries, oftentimes occupying powers. So you've got a, a, a delicate diplomatic balance between toughening the sanctions, um, making the Iranians more defiant, mm. or withdrawing the threat and then embracing them in terms of a, of a negotiation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to join me in thanking, uh, from the Canadian point of view, our man in Tehran and our woman in Tehran.